Um, welcome everyone to the last uh, Crown Seminar of 2022. I do apologize um, for the slight delay, but technology is not perfect, even though humans are. Um, it gives me great, great pleasure to welcome um, our speaker for today's seminar, Brahim El Gwabli, and our um, wonderful moderator, um, Samia Henni, to our event today. Um, Brahim is a, an assistant professor of Arabic studies and comparative literature at Williams College and the author of the forthcoming book. And just because I know you're all waiting for it as much as I am, it will be coming in February 2023. It's called Moroccan Other Archives, History and Citizenship After State Violence. He is also the co-editor of a two-volume Lama, Lama Lif which is a critical anthology of societal debates in Morocco during the years of lead, which is 1966 to 1988, and ref refiguring loss, Jews remembered in Maghribi and Middle Eastern cultural production. Um, his scholarly uh, articles have appeared in many, many, many different places. And what's very delightful to me is that Brahim also has a lot of public facing writing and my favorite of his essays is one he wrote for the Marquez Review called My Amazigh um, Indigeneity, The Bifurcated Roots of a Native Moroccan. Um, his talk today is based on a second book that he's writing provisionally titled Saharan Imaginations Between Saharanism and Ecocare. And I'd like to point out to Brahim and to everyone um, that we purposefully scheduled this event, um, even though we scheduled it in advance, we made sure that Morocco beat Spain yesterday, just <laughs> to set him up for this wonderful talk today. Um, Samia Henni, who will be um, in conversation with Brahim, is an historian of the built, destroyed, and imagined environments, and teaches at the Department of Architecture, the College of Architecture, Art, and Planning at Cornell University. She's the author of the multi-award winning Architecture of Counter-Revolution, The French Army in Northern Algeria, the editor of Deserts Are Not Empty, which I had the great pleasure of looking at and is just a fantastic book, which just recently this year came out, and War Zones. She's also the maker of exhibitions such as Archives, Secret Defense, Housing Pharmacology, and Discrete Violence, Architecture and the French War in Algeria. And these have been exhibited all over the world. Um, she was the Albert Hirschman Chair at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Marseille and a Geddes Fellow at Edinburgh School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. Um, before I quickly um, give the microphone to Brahim, just wanna just remind everyone that if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A section, chat is closed. Um, and so if you put it there, we won't see it, but if you put it in the Q&A, we will. And the way it's gonna um, proceed as it always does, which is that Brahim is gonna speak to us for about seven minutes. Um, then he and Samia will have a conversation on the topic of Saharanism. Um, and then we will have about 30 minutes of questions, which I will sort of pick and ask both of our wonderful participants today. And with that, Brahim, take it from there. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nirma and uh, Karen and Raymar and uh, Samia. It's, it's a really uh, an honor and a great pleasure uh, to be able to share this work with you all. And um, I look forward to your questions and uh, your um, engaging with your thoughts about this work. Uh, so, uh, this book is uh, emerged from my longtime interest in, in deserts and in the study of deserts, and particularly looking at how uh, culture production produces deserts and reflects deserts and, uh, and how deserts move from being physical spaces to being a discourse and being an imagination, and then being an imaginary. Uh, so one thing that's really interesting about deserts is they, they exist across the different uh, continents. <clears throat> they are both hot and cold. 
And what's interesting is that there are certain parallels that exist between different sorts of culture production produced about deserts, whether in North in America, in the Americas, in Australia, in Asia, in, in, in Africa, and of course, in um, uh, like the cold deserts in, in Russia and other places. Uh, However, like the question that started me thinking about uh, uh, Saharanism as, as a concept that can be used to talk about deserts and study them and see the way they are produced is particularly the absence of, of a conceptual framework that can help us put deserts in conversation with each other and also to think across deserts rather than think about the Sahara or for example, the Sonoran or the Australian desert and all of this. So uh, my, my hope in kind of like elaborating on this concept of Saharanism is to create some sort of, although like the Sahara as a space is, is, is very present and we can say that the Sahara is the oldest probably desert in the world, but uh, Saharanism as a concept can help us deploy some sort of like methodological tools that we can can help us to understand what happens and across deserts globally. And the sentence that I like, that's really very descriptive uh, of, 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 uh, of the phenomenon of, of Saharanism is this sentence that we hear all the time in the United States, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And to me, deconstructing, just deconstructing this sentence uh, can open up a lot of space for us to think about Saharanism. First of all, what happens in Vegas? Why should it stay in Vegas? And uh, like uh, what sort of ethical and moral values are associated with Vegas, for example, as a desertic space? And then uh, launching from there thinking about deserts as spaces for transgression, for a lot of stuff. And that's where Saharanism comes in for me. So I, I define Saharanism as a racializing and extractive imaginary. By racializing, I mean that it's, 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 a, it's a concept that deploys race and categorization of people, either indigenous, non-indigenous, uh, white uh, or non-white, and different uh, levels of hierarchies that go with authority and power. Extractive imaginary, in, in ext by extraction, I mean taking away, like you come to the desert with this idea that you are going to gain something from it. Either extraction can be material or it can be immaterial. We, when we talk about material extraction, of course, we're talking about oil, uranium, minerals, but when all, we're also talking about immaterial extraction, which can be spirituality in the desert, right? C contemplation in the desert. And what are you giving back in this relationship in which you're dislocating or taking? And of course, when we think about histories of slavery, we can also think about, think about extracting people from the desert, particularly when we go all the way back to the Greek encounter with the desert and the use of the word Ethiopian, uh, which meant at that time, burned faces or the countries of burned faces. So racialization is already imbricated on this older imaginary of deserts. And uh, uh, more specifically then, this Saharanism entails a universalizing idea of deserts as empty and lifeless spaces, providing the conceptual justification for brutal, conscienceless, and life-threatening actions in desert environments. So when we think about deserts today, we think about at atomic bombs being tested, we think about chemical weapons, we think about border control, we think about the testing of new technologies, drones, uh, like uh, highly sensitive sensors on the ground, and, and all of this, and, and, uh, and all, all of these imaginaries actually build on what they call Saharanism or this long-term imaginary and provides what they call the ideational blueprint for projects whose existence and survival require deserts to remain fearsome, threatening, and dead in, in the public colonial imagination. And of course, I don't need to debunk the idea of emptiness of the desert because uh, my interlocutor here today, Samia Hini, has done an amazing job in debunking that and in uh, developing this amazing concept called the regimes of emptiness, uh, in which uh, she, uh, she that she uses to introduce uh, her book. So this is uh, 
And what's interesting about Saharanism, when you think about it, and when you start asking these questions that I'm just asking, you see it everywhere. It pervades all desert-focused activities and cultural production, and by extension, many other aspects of modern societies. So whether you look at deserts in the United States, in Australia, in other places, you'll see these parallels emerging when you look for them. And uh, this it follows from this definition that deserts are produced as threatening, uh, hors la loi, outlawed spaces uh, where, but also they are outside ethical and environmental considerations. If I ask the audience today, how many of you, for example, think about environmental environmentalism in the desert or how do environment or how does environmental consciousness apply to desert spaces? Have you ever considered thinking about the desert as a space that's endangered, for example, as we think about the sea, about the whales, about sharks, uh, wildlife in the desert, for example, and its, its e extinction compared to life at sea? And I think there we can see that the difference of the conception of life itself and what's living and what's not, what's what's worth saving, what's not, what's, what's worth advocating for, really differs between the sea and the desert. Uh, uh, the, it also follows from this that deserts are considered infinitely extractable, uh, imaginative, ma Im imaginatively malleable. Uh, this means that people can come to deserts with all sorts of projects that they can manipulate desert spaces to, to, to create or be able to carry out. It's almost like a blue, like a, a virgin fertile soil for any sort of experimentation with ideas, with projects, with foolish stuff that I can, I can answer when we talk. And then of course, deserts as racialized spaces par excellence, uh, like the army, labor, settlement, and, and all of this actually has uh, historical racial categories that go back to encounter with uh, European explorers and their creation of images of deserts. And I'm here, I just put one of them here, uh, which uh, uh, René Caillé, who wrote Voyage à Timbuktu et à Jenny. Like he was the first European person to have actually made it to Timbuktu and to have debunked the myth of Timbuktu as a land of gold. Uh, it, it also shows up in, in, in cinema uh, and um, you can see this from the 19, from the 1943 uh, film Sahara, uh, Timbo, uh, this Sudanese soldier with an American, uh, with the American officer, like on the tank that gets lost in the in Tabrak, and it's very interesting to see like the uh, uh, hierarchies that are created between different races in the film. And then Saharanism is deeply entwined into in in the military science because the first encounters between the desert and uh, Europeans or with the people who um, whom I subscribed under this uh, I subsume under this category of Saharanism uh, is uh, our soldiers, explorers and soldiers, but also people tied to intelligence and spying agencies and all of that at that point. Uh, the line between exploration and the, the army, particularly in the 19th century, was really very, very, very blurry. And here I just put two examples of French um, uh, officers. This one is Commandant Flatter, who was assassinated in, in 1881, and his assassination by the Tuaregs while, while he was on an explora uh, exploration mission to see where the Trans-African Saharan Trail could be created, the train that the French were trying to connect the Mediterranean to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and he was assassinated uh, by the Tuaregs. And this event becomes really foundational for a very rich and entirely underexplored military literature about the, the Sahara. And then he literally, like his image, his memory has created the, the desert as a threatening space. Then uh, we have Charles de Foucault, who becomes a priest, but before that he was a, a Saint-Syrien. He, he, he graduated from the prestigious Saint-Serre 
uh, uh, French uh, army army school, and this is his friend La Pyrene. La Pyrene was the founder of the Saharan units known as um, the Saharan units, and also the commander of the military territories of the Oasis. And, and this boy, I suspect that actually Charles de Foucault bought this boy in Beni Abbas in Algeria, and, um, and he writes a lot about, about him. Uh, one of the interesting things that they found is that in, in one of the blogs, because there is also a, a very rich uh, like uh, digital life for these for these people, and uh, says that their goals, meaning La Pyrene and Charles de Foucault, their goals were not similar. The military officer wanted to win the Sahara for France, while the priest wanted to win it over for, for Christ. And it's very interesting to think about this, this space as being uh, like a space for different imaginations and thinkings about state policy and authority. And then you can see also the desert Saharanism being able to sustain itself through commemoration, through memorialization, through paraphernalia uh, that, that, that really um, uh, build and create an image of it. And then um, I, I, want, I move from the army to spirituality particularly through the case of Charles de Foucault. Charles de Foucault has become the lens through which the Sahara is, is seen, actually. Uh, and he just became a saint in, in 2022. And he was assassinated by the Tuaregs in, in 1916. And um, his whole project was actually very, very disturbing in many ways, because if you look at this book, just the title of the book, for example, could kind of like make you shudder. But people don't see how he talks about the Tuaregs, for example, as he, he uses, for example, the word, je vais apprivoiser les, apprivoiser les Tuaregs, meaning taming the Tuaregs. And using this animalistic language, actually, that racializes the Tuareg casts them as these violent people, but who only through Christianity could they be brought into the, the, the fold of humanity. And Saharanism has this power to, uh, to dominate, to kind of like read the desert through its own discourse. And they looked at Google, for example, if you just Google Charles de Foucault, you instantly get 2,730,000 uh, like mentions just in 50 seconds, which is, Amazing. So the literature around Charles de Foucault is really amazing. And then it connects also to Cornel uh, Commandant Flatter's story. And um, it pervades all sorts of media. Here is like a, a, a cartoon. I actually made a mistake here. It's 1959. Uh, and, and then you go deeper into uh, cartoons and the desert actually becomes flattened. It becomes dunes. It becomes a space for mir mir mirages and also a space for sabotage. And particularly if you look L'Or Noir, the black gold, it's, it, it, it refers to oil and you see the oil derricks here. And then the, 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 the mirage, and you see here an act of sabotage, the oil pipeline being sabotaged by, uh, by some people. And then it, 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 the desert again is flattened here. And these pictures, particularly refer to the, to the work of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. And then you see that there is a lineage, actually, a cultural lineage that's happening. I'll finish soon. And then I come to, to this picture where I have Saharanism as a concept also infiltrated literature, like with André Gide, with Paul Bowles. It infiltrates industry with the story of Labadi. But I think it's most interesting um, uh, security applications appear in the United States and in the work of Frontex, particularly through immigration and migration. And then they finish here and they just want to kind of like say that when I conceptualize Saharanism, I'm not talking only about Europeans, but I also look at local manifestations of Saharanism. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the Saudi city being built called Neom. And if you look at this picture, it's, it's an amazing, it's like a science fiction work trying to project something new onto the desert. And I think about how embracing Saharanism by local leaders and the discourses that were produced about deserts in other places, and um, think about like the local manifestations or like what are the dangers of seeing the Sahara or the desert or deserts from lenses that were constructed elsewhere.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Prahim, for this really illuminating presentation and for trying to um, conceptualize a concept in a few minutes. So I really appreciate that. <laughs> Maybe to help our audience, um, I, 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 I do see your screen right now. Eh? I don't know if others can see it. I, I, it's just that it's 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 frozen in a very weird position as if you are about to close. Ah, now it's okay. Sorry. I, I don't know if other people will see the same thing. As that's why as, as you like, you can leave it or yeah. So, you know, I really, really appreciate. So I propose to try to um, maybe pose on moments of this conceptualization. Um, I have a couple here and um, I will be mindful of also our time. Maybe the very first one <clears throat> is the, you know, you use, so Saharanism, so this is a really a concept that is helping, will help us and is helping us to really try to connect deserts and to read them along and against themselves sometimes. Um, and I'm very fascinated by these three terms that you use, imagination, imaginary, and maybe we can start a little bit there. Um, you use both these terms, imagination, imaginary. You also use the term, you know, rationalized um, or rationalizing. So maybe we can try to understand first the use of imagination and imaginary and their relationship to time. Mm -hmm. um, in some of the examples you give, especially at the at the very end, you know, when you talk about how Charles de Foucault um, wrote uh, and rationalized the, the Tuareg, you rarely, maybe it's me, but you rarely use the term colonial or racist, you know. Um, so maybe we can start there to uh, try to understand a little bit this notion of so imagination imaginary in relation to the colonial past and the coloniality of the present. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Samia. This is, this is terrific. Uh, uh, so I use it, I, I use this, uh, these terms, imagination and imaginary, uh, interchangeably, particularly because I want to move a little bit from discourse. Uh, and uh, think uh, think more in terms of like imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, and imagination allows me to think more about fiction, but also to think about histories and to think about uh, about about like, you know, positive, probably if you want to say positive knowledge that's constructed about the desert, but also to make the next move to think about how fiction, how, projected things actually happen or are inscribed into this project. So uh, I did not want to go the route of uh, discourse because then that would take me to the, into the route of like Orientalism and like the question that I expect people to ask. Uh, 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 and I just want to make this very important distinction. And I look at um, literature, I look at you know, graphic novels, they look at film, I look at different uh, different media, and they just thought that at the bottom of all of this, or all of this is undergirded by a certain imaginary, mm -hmm. uh, a certain position from which people are either, either were in the desert and kind of like came back and wrote about it in a way that kind of like, produced it in the way they lived it or in an imagined way, or people who have never been to a desert and wrote about deserts uh, from their locations in Europe or in America or in other places, then the, the desert also becomes this imaginary space. But of course, discourse, we cannot escape discourse because at the end, we still produce a discourse about a, a, a place. And what's really interesting about I love your question about temporality and time. I think there are some constants about the desert that that continue that continue to be deployed uh, the, uh, through time. Uh, of course, like the 
a, a, a racism, the racism, for example, that was very conspicuous in the 19th century, in the middle of the 20th century, up until independence, has has regressed in a lot of ways. You don't see it as much, for example, in the literature that we read today. Uh, however, there are also images that continue to exist in, in, in our imaginary or in the imaginaries that are produced about deserts, particularly like uh, this phrase that was um, first used by uh, uh, Eugene Fromontin, which is le pays de la soif, yes. uh, the land of thirst. Like if you look up French, for example, sources, even today, they still refer to the desert as le pied de la soif. And it's, mm -hmm. it's sustained in ways that really give this idea that the desert is the land of thirst. And when the French decided, for example, to detonate their bombs in the desert, this le pied de, de la soif becomes very interesting because it's Tanzroft, you know, Tanzroft, the Tanzroft desert, which in the French imagination, it's the deadliest place in the desert, the emptiest place in the desert. That's where they decided to detonate these bombs. And this phrase actually, si le pied de la soif, the land of thirst where nobody lives, where there is no life. And then um, that actually continues. Another thing that continues is this flattening of deserts. If you read specialists of deserts like Gautier, Capot, and the others who, who wrote like academic studies about the desert, you see that they're very, very nuanced in their work on deserts. And they really present very interesting details about the richness of the space, of life, of pe people populating them. Of course, with their tinge of colonial, as you say, racializing ideologies uh, and this sense of governmentality that the colonial regime is the one that's entitled to govern uh, the, particularly the Sahara. However, when you look at the popular imaginations or the popularized ways in which film and media and uh, literature deploy the desert, then the richness of the desert is erased and it becomes sand dunes. Mm -hmm. So in the desert, there is actually the erg, the erg is the sand dune, and there is the rug, Rug is the place with the stony desert and mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, and mountains and rivers and wadis. All of that disappears and it becomes this uniform monolithic space that's mm -hmm. only dunes. And then the dune becomes actually the space that's associated with Saharanism in my in my analysis because then you think about the dune. You don't think about obstacles. You just think about this is an amazing dune. You can do whatever you want to do with it. And uh, so, yeah, so that's like number one. And the the colonial regime, I think, is really interesting to think about uh, because then coloniality leads us to uh, to regimes of governmentality. Mm -hmm. And it's particularly in that, I mean, this ties a lot to your work, the formidable work you did. And that's where common, like, like La Pyrene, the general that I was talking about, and Charles de Foucault and this overlap between the spiritual and the army authority. And of course, with the scholarly authority really overlap to create this desert that becomes a matter of life or death for like, here we are talking mainly about France, but in the 1960s, that desert becomes really this amazing space that the French did not even imagine themselves to dissociate from or give independence to, or I mean, with the OCRS, um, uh, they, they even created this entity within the mm -hmm. desert. I'm trying to, 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 to translate what, what it means. Uh, Organisation commune des régions sahariennes, uh, the uh, common organization of the Saharan regions, which was another, another manifestation of the Saharanism in its administrative <laughs> and military rearrangement of space and people. Thank you, Sam. Thank, no, thank you very much, Brahim. This is really fascinating. Maybe, um, maybe eh, one could also include the term imagery. So we have imagination, imaginary, and imagery. So as from images, and this is really coming from this conversation, but also from the uh, sources you use, you know, films, so there are visuals, uh, uh, cartoons and uh, uh, photographs. I mean, all of that 
is also acting, operating along with the text. And this brings me to the second question about the question, yeah, about the, not really the discourse, so to move away from the discourse, we can maybe talk about the notion of archive. Mm. You know, the, you said elsewhere that the desert is a sort of archive. It's an epistemic space. Mm. But you also talked about the this archive. And mm. I have the feeling that with the Saharianism, with this notion, with this concept, you are also trying to provide to challenge the archive, this archive. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? Okay, great, amazing. Thank you. Uh, so the way I understand the archive, like uh, in theory, uh, like um, uh, if you read like Caroline Stidman, Mbembe, Derrida, you know, um, um, oh, Stolman, and, uh, uh, St uh, oh, no, I, I St Stoller, it. Stoller, I'm not a Stoller. Stoller. Yes. Yeah, Stoller. So I think the, the question that the, the question of archive for me or my takeaway from this issue of archive is really that archives exist and uh, the theory really deals with the ideas that within the archives there is excision, there is silence, there is there are this like uh, yes. unspokenness of the archive, right? However, I flip this question, for example, in my analysis and think about what do we do when archives don't exist in the way we understand them. Because after all, we do use archives abusively in the ways we use it on, in our everyday lives, but archives actually have to be official and have to go from the private into the official and have to be stamped by this stamp of officialdom, which happens through discussions of questions of provenance, questions of appraisal. Once appraisal happens and then archives get moved into an official building and they're locked, like they're intramural. Mm -hmm. And then they acquire this validity or what Foucault says, the possibility to make historical statements, like that's the, their legitimacy comes from. And then, uh, in, so if we want to use archives in this sense, we would not really know much about deserts, right? Because yeah. they're locked. We we are up against all these sorts of like, you know, uh, <laughs> limitation, temporal limitations. Uh, like in my country, Morocco, we didn't have an archive until 90, until 2011. And then they recently passed a law about organizing archives. So it's amazing that Morocco finally has an archive, but then they passed this law decree that makes it almost impossible for us mm -hmm. in our generation to see this archive because some of the limitations are like in 40 years, 70 years, 80, you know, 100 years. That's like the, the, the way I understand archive. I understand this archiving, which is a term I coined to think about all these ways in which the desert actually does not hide anything. So Saharanism associates the, the sentence about, about uh, Las Vegas, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. For me, it's all about secrecy, about hiddenness, about the fact that you can bury anything in the desert and it will never come back, whether it's like moral, immoral, whatever. But then they come up with this idea of this archiving and think about the wind think about the change in the elements and then how somewhere where there is a dune might reveal rocks the next day or might reveal a wall that's probably like an extent civilization. You were talking in your work about the French burial of all this toxic material in the desert and then the winds come and the erosion brings it out. And that's this archiving. Uh, yes. But this archiving, not, on this, not in the sense of undermining the archive, but actually archive here as something that's burying something, but then the desert and buries it and makes it possible for, for us to think about. And then if we think about the desert as a space for this archiving, we can do a lot of stuff with it. We can think about histories. We can think about uh, epistemologies, we can think about methodologies, and then we can think about the desert as a methodology, like a, as a mm. way of reading, as a way of thinking, as a way of writing. And I would say that what I, I find fascinating about that is the mobility that's in mm. all of this. It's, it's really, it's mobile, it's unexpected, the unexpectedness, you know? Uh, and one of the things with the archive in the French sense, for example, 
you ex you know what you're expecting in a box, <laughs> right? Right? You know what's in yeah. a box. Whereas with this archiving, there is this idea of shock, of surprise, of something that you will find out that you probably were not thinking thinking about. So. I hope that answers your question. Absolutely fascinating. I think it's absolutely fair. Maybe a last question, just because I'm, um, yeah, mindful of time, and there are like fascinating questions coming up. My God, this is a fantastic audience. We are very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so the last question is about translation. Uh -huh. So Saharanism is the way that that now you presented it. It's in English, but. You speak Arabic, French, and Temeziert. And I wonder um, if you could tell us a little bit about how you move, about the mobility within languages, mm -hmm. about the way that you think and you are expecting or encouraging others to either understand this notion or mm -hmm. further translate it, maybe. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, and that opens up a, an, another level of this thinking um, through these languages. For example, if you think about Tamazight, which I speak, uh, in Tamazight they use Tama, which means the edge, or they, they talk about Tinari Win. Tinari Win in Tamazight means, uh, you know, of course, the band Tinari Win, which is very famous, which, but Tinari Win means deserts. So in the Amazigh conception, the desert is actually deserts. And it's it's just fascinating to think about the desert as not being monolithic, but as being different deserts. And of course, in, in Arabic also, the word Sahra does not really mean desertness in the, in the same uh, way or meaning it, it, it evokes in English. And then, uh, of course, French, uh, very close to English in that, in, in, in that sense. And for me, reading all these sources, like I constantly move between these languages and like think about them. And first, uh, 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 so I really haven't thought about the con the conception in, in Tamazight, for example, but Saharanism in Arabic can be a Sahraniya or al istishar or or something that can that can actually be uh, be very close to al istishraq for example or some yeah. or something like that you know but at the same time we have to be very careful to make these distinctions because you know Sahar, like orientalism is a very powerful theory mm -hmm. uh, and we are talking here about a very specific uh geographical space that has geographical and environmental characteristics and so the conception of saharanism should be applied to deserts and desertness and, and these spaces rather than something large and broad uh, in, 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 in that regard. But since this work is still in the making, I'm still writing it, I'm still thinking about it, there is a lot to reflect on, but that's a, a wonderful question. But also translation just as like works being translated, right? Like uh, Ibrahim Al-Kuni be Libyan writing, uh, Berber Amazir, yes writing in Arabic and living in the Alps for a long time in Swiss, in Switzerland, and everything is about the desert, then, <laughs> lo you know, local, local writers also writing in <laughs> French and Arabic. And so it's, it's really, it's really a fascinating thing to think about translation and what it does and how uh, stuff also is. And just like the pictures that they showed you about Neom, like thinking about Neom being produced in Walt Disney or some designer sitting in New York and thinking about building a city in Saudi Arabia and yeah. in the desert in Saudi Arabia. There is also an act of translation there, thinking about space uh, and geography and all of that. Thank you very much, Brahim. Thank you both. This was um, this is fascinating, and um, I'm just going to pick up what Samia said, which is we always get really great great questions from our audience, but today it's just like popping. <laughs> you can just feel the electricity in um, the questions. There are so many questions, and what I'm going to do is try to. I'm not going to get to everyone's questions, but please know that we will be giving a transcript of the questions to Brahim. Um, and Semya, so they can have it and sort of um, think through your questions. I'll put some of the questions together and sort of hit on themes. And Semya, please feel free to um, join in in the conversation. I'm just going to start actually. So a lot of the questions, as you can see, is is 
what about Saharanism and? Um, because really your presentation has also expanded our imagination of what we can do with this concept. So the first one is gonna, I'm gonna sort of begin with um, the idea of what about the desert and prison and deserts and political tools. And in this particular case, um, the question, the person who asked the question obviously loves your work, but also asks about um, Tezmamet, the prison that was built in 1972, it's in the middle of desert. And since you've already worked on the question of political prisoners, Ibrahim, let's start to start you out with that. So can you talk about the desert as a political to, tool for subduing um, political opponents? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, does this, do you see this slide, Saharan Gothic? Yes. Okay, so uh, yeah, so uh, that's a that's a fascinating question. And deserts have been used as tools for punishment for a very long time. And whether in the Arabian Peninsula, whether in North Africa, people were exiled to the desert. And uh, Albert Mimi has an amazing has an amazing novel called The Desert, uh, in which this prince. Uh, was uh, stripped of his power, of his right to succession, and he was sent into the desert where he grew up and like spent a lot of time reflecting and meditating, and then he becomes this political agent. Uh, reading about it, it's really about this story. I think it, it's an allegory for the life story of Ibn Khaldun. I don't know because he, mean, he, he meets Timur Lane in, later and in, in Damascus and all of this. So this is about history. In terms of prison day imprisonment, Samia actually did work on that. But I want to talk about Tazmamat and they want to talk about uh, the existence of like French prisons in the Sahara, but also linking the Sahara to islands. It's, it's very important to think about deserts in relation to islands because these are considered separate, confined uh, spaces where people can actually go to rot or to die, or where isolation can happen. And of course, the case of Tazma Mart is, 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 is a classic case of uh, uh, a secret prison where the state sent people for 30 years, no, not 30 years, sorry, for 18 years, pretending that they never existed. Uh, so the Sahara here works as an element of disappearance. And they think it takes us back to this idea of of, of, of Vegas, like uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens in the desert stays in the desert. Uh, and uh, the, the broader implications of this question is that the desert is outside the law and outside the normative ethics where you can do anything to people without any sort of accountability. Because this is all about accountability, right? And when you think about French prisons in, 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 in the Sahara, the labor camps during the Vichy regime, they were all in the desert and they come from the same idea that the desert can hide things. Uh, but luckily with the Ankara, uh, this archiving that's happening and people doing all this work, we know so much about these prisons, who, who, were, who was in them, how they were treated. We have remnants. And Tazma Mart now is going to be like a memorial. I think they they were they it was it was supposed to be opened just like this month, but I don't know what happened with that. Anyway, I think Tazma Mart actually shifted from being a hidden prison into like the most iconoclastic uh, image of Moroccan collective memory in the 20th century in regards to state violence. And then if you want more about this, I wrote this chapter. I, I work with this concept of Saharan Gothic and desert necrofiction. And I bring in actually the Middle East and North Africa. And it's coming out, I think, if it's, it hasn't already come out. And it, it, it should answer this question in, in, in a lot of detail. Sami, do you want to add anything? All right, well, so let's just stay on this direct um, idea of just the direct idea of politics for a second. Um, and we lost Brahim. <laughs> no, I, I'm here. Uh, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to, um, to charge my, my computer. <laughs> um, and so I'm just going to take this idea we talked about 
you know, the desert and, and political prisoners. But um, there's another question here about the idea of nomadism and mobility mm-hmm. and the desert and the concept of Saharanism um, in relation to the idea of the Hadara and the anxieties of the state to settle nomadic populations. Um, and I think that is quite, that was, it, it, it happens all over at least the region that I know very well, which is the Middle East. So I was wondering if you could talk about that part of, so this is, a, we talked about tools of political suppression, but what about state anxiety and nomadism and the idea of Saharanism? Wonderful. So I, I think that's a great question. I think, I think thinking about state state building efforts and as they relate to Saharanism is really is really fascinating and they think I allude to that in the last the last image I showed about Saudi Arabia right how does Saharanism become a tool of legitimacy for a ruler uh, how can you build a vision uh, for a state or a country based on a re-envisioning of the desert or uh, I call it in one of my articles, undesert in the desert. Uh, in, uh, so, so here, like this, this vision, the, the, you, you, see the, you see this, right? This vision here is like, it's called the line. It's almost like $500 billion to build the city called the line in the desert. And just looking at the images, images and the way it's, um, it's, it's, it's kind of like uh, produced. Do you, see the, do you see the share? No. Okay, now let me let me see. Sorry, I thought that they were sharing my. Okay, so here it is. So so the line, for example, is a very interesting is a very interesting example of of, of, of that kind of of work where Saharanism becomes becomes a vision for a state. It becomes a vision for renewal, for change, for reform. Uh, and then it becomes also a PR operation. The desert actually here operates in a way that signals the readiness to transform a state and develop a different kind of like country. Uh, and here uh, uh, it's it's like Saudi, the new Saudi Arabia and the vision of 2030. And the desert is, is really central to that project. And I, I don't know, I haven't seen any, the, all, the only person who did this kind of project was Qaddafi in the 1980s when he built that river, al Nahr al-Sina'i the, al-Azim, the, the, the great artificial river, yeah, which failed, of course, as a vision uh, because he was trying to, to bring water uh, to irrigate the Sahara. But... I think one of the works where we can see also the impact of, of, of this vision of Saharanism is Abdul Rahman Munib's novel, Cities of Salt, Mudin al Milh. In Mudin al Milh, there is petro capitalism with a local emir with an American vision of extraction in the desert. What, what it does is it, it transforms a nomadic society into a proletarian society that lives in, a, in, in under a manichaean division between the American compound and the local population. So when you think about these questions of urbanization and versus nomadism, I think we should also think about processes of proletarianism. How do you transform nomads from being freewheeling people, moving uh, across deserts, enjoying an oasis, having indigenous practices, you know, uh, uh, notions of honor, whether we agree with them or not, I'm not saying, I'm not, uh, whether we, ag- I'm being critical here. What, what, what's, what really imports here, like when you read Mudun al Milh, is that petrocapitalism has transformed the nomad into a settler. And from being a settler, the nomad is transformed into a proletarian agent who then works for capitalism and he get, who gets exploited. And in this novel, in Abdul Rahman Munif's Cities of Salt, there are two characters, one called Ibn Rashid, who immediately subscribes to the American oil explorers project and helps them. And he becomes a small capitalist within a traditional society. And one of the, sa- one of the saddest moments in this novel is actually when Ibn Rashid decides to take away the camels from the workers, to prevent them from 
running into the desert because they noticed that some people would just work for a few days and then decide to leave. So they take away their camels. And to me, that's like one of the moments where you see this desire to urbanize, to make people settle, but how does that clash with cherished values of mobility, uh, of freedom, or that they associate with their prior existence. And then of course, when you think about Saharanism, and I think this question actually comes from probably uh, a Deleuze Guattari uh, approach, uh, that is like Deleuze and Guattari make this distinction between the smooth and striated space. And smooth space is the space of freedom, striated space is space of control, urban development and state. And they think they associate Saharanism, they associate nomadism with the smooth space in the desert, whereas the other space is the space of control. And they think if you go that route, it's also possible to say that the imposition of uh, state jurisdiction on deserts or desert peoples leads to forms of control that exist in the urban environment. And they think that, and that's one of the ways, for example, we, can, we should also be thinking about like the situation in Mali and in, in like in the Sahel and like uh, just regimes of control and, and the desire to, to escape that. And one novel that I thought was really amazing in doing that kind of work is called Tabib Timbuktu, the physician of Timbuktu. And it's about, in, and it's about like the aftermath of the French uh, nuclear tests and the mobility of the people in the Sahel from like the Hogar to Ghana to other places. And you can follow people's movement through the fallout of the nuclear testing, which is uh, a fascinating work uh, written by a Malian novelist. Maybe just quickly to uh, maybe bring this back to your work, uh, Brahim. So sedentarizing nomadic population is part of what you call infinitely extractable. Mm. I see it very much related to the extraction, the idea of extraction and the idea also of this time. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because everything is extractable. I mean, cities of salt, this is the thing, is like a lot of readings have focused on like reading these works through Orientalism. I think if we open up our conceptual methods and think creatively about them, we can actually open them up to some really novel interpretations. That does, that, that does not take away from the power of Orientalism. It rather offers some new alternative readings that have been ignored or overlooked through methodological choices. Um, so let's, let's, there were a lot of questions about borders. You got the Orientalism question. I think you've like really given people at least the beginnings of ways of thinking about these things differently. So let's shift away from states and borders to the question of spirituality about which you've gotten quite a number um, of questions. And um, I'm gonna, again, combine a bunch of them, but um, uh, one of the questions is asking about spiritual Saharanism and its relationship, if there is one, with Sufi involvement in politics against, uh, across the Sahara. The question is where might Islam and or Sufism be related, involved or pushing back on colonial French conceptualizations of the spiritual? Um, and give the examples they give are local notions of the des desert, al ghaib and colonial notions of emptiness. And relatedly, there was a question about also Saharanism as pushing against, you know, Islam and Christianity. If So it's not just within Sufism, but is it, um, and I think here the colonial aspect of it also becomes a borderline. So I guess basically all aspects of spiritual Saharanism, <laughs> everything you know, in one minute go. <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing question. Oh, these are amazing questions. And uh, it's really fascinating to think, I mean, for me, this idea of spiritual Saharanism comes to me from three, three sources. Uh, of course, Charles de Foucault occupies the central part in this work. Isabel Eberhardt, who was, who was a Swiss-Russian 
uh, transgender uh, or cross-dresser who was born a woman, but he she cross-dressed as, as, as a man and she married an Algerian guy and she lived in Beni Abbas and the, the, the region. She was friends with Lioti, uh, General Marshal Lioti, and she was really deeply involved in the French army's, um, you know, uh, work in the, in the Sahara. And she was a Sufi. Uh, and and then uh, there was this Italian priest named Carlo Carreto who wrote a book called Letters from the Desert. So if you think about Christian spirituality or spirit, the, the, like uh, spiritual Saharanism, it's this isolation in the desert, seeking of solitude, being close to God, and uh, and there are two, three moments here, like with Charles de Foucault, it's an active endeavor to bring the, the Sahara under French dominance through spirituality. So he called the people in the Sahara des infidèles, infidels. He uses the N-word to refer to people a lot. Uh, and he and he uses this animalistic language about taming them, apprivoiser, 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 taming people, civilizing them. And he actually, uh, he, he, he also talks about these people in the Sahara being lost to God. Uh, they are lost to God and, and, and to Christianity. But in his work, he associates this very interesting idea of the civilization, civilizing mission with spiritual um, saving or redemption with a sort of uh, with a sort of humanistic desire to come to help local populations because they were poor, they were needy, they were all they needed medicine, they needed food. So it's it's a philanthropic project with very deep, dark, racist uh, undertones, if, if you want. But it all makes sense for him and to his audience, who is like millions and millions of people, even, even, even today. So uh, the dissonance for me is, how can you, like, as a spiritual pe person, reconcile these elements of being pro-military pro government? He even has a plan for the French government on the best way to subdue the Tuaregs in the desert. Uh, and it, it, it's really fascinating. So that relates to the legacy. So uh, his legacy then becomes the legacy of other people like Carlo, Carlo Carrito comes into the desert in the 1960s, in, 1950, in 1954, and he stays there until 1964. What's really interesting about this book is that it has been translated into many, many languages that they can't even know, sold millions of copies. And Carlo Carrito, is in Algeria, in the Algerian desert, at the height of the French war on Algeria. But he says nothing about it. Uh, he says nothing about it. The desert just becomes a space for him to isolate, to think about God, to think about like uh, catechism and to, 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 to fantasize about spirituality. But the real condition of the people around him, the oppressive condition of colonialism is just absent. So again, you ask yourself, this is, this is spirituality, this is interesting, but what about how does spirituality forget about systems of oppression around it? And this brings me to this question of, of, of Sufism. Sufis, and, and I'm sorry, I mean, if we have Sufis in the audience, Sufis have historically been used by the French in, in both in Morocco and Algeria and other places to advance the colonial project. So, uh, there, I mean, there were the Sufis who were against and the Sufis who were pro-colonialism. Uh, and the Snusis, of course, when Charles de Foucault is killed, a lot of the ire and the anger of the uh, writers who, who took on the project of writing his life actually were very critical of the Snusi, Sanusia, uh, uh, Libyan um, Sufi order because they were anti-colonial, but they also had their hand with the Fran with the Germans. So the Germans told or ordered or kind of like insinuated the idea to the Snusi to kill Charles de Foucault. This is at least what they found in French sources. So within the Sufi groups, 
there are groups, there are um, schools that subscribe to the French, like the Tijaniya, for example, who subscribe to the French vision of the desert, who, who endorsed it, helped it, were very involved in it, and those who were uh, against it. But Isabel Eberhardt becomes really interesting because she, she identifies as a Sufi, and she belonged to uh, Qadiriya. She was a Qadiriya, but which and the Qadiriya was against the Tijani. And the only time that Isabel Eberhardt gets attacked when she was in Algeria was actually, she was actually attacked by a Tijani who tried to kill her for being a Qadiriya. But again, when you think about her and her trip to Morocco, she was sent by Marshal Lyoti to go to Morocco to spy on some oases by between Figuig and the Algerian border. And the stuff that she says is just, in, I can't even repeat that stuff here in this talk without shocking everyone. It's, it's incredibly in, insensitive. But at the same time, she talks about, the way she talks about slaves and black people that she encounters and all of that is really, is really disturbing and they can, I can't repeat it here. So, but the bottom line is that spirituality is a very high ground, a very fertile ground for Saharanism and its tropes and, uh, and for, uh, for developing um, control, state control and um, in the desert, uh, particularly in this place. Samia, do you want to add in terms of, you know, also your own work about, you know, the desert is not empty and how it relates to this question? If you like, I was just, yeah, there are so many questions. So I, I should be quiet. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, what you call disturbing is highly racist, highly colonialist, highly patronizing, highly, you know, it's just... Yeah. That's somehow really part of that, you know, colonial project, but also militarization, I would call it also of the mind of people as well. You know, you talked about the military. So there was, you know, even though there were this um, dialogues or this contact between um, all these cultures, I think the, the frame um, of representing, understanding, and even living within th those communities were again very much violent and very much colonial for me, at least. Yeah, yeah uh, maybe to go back to the question of, of emptiness, I think you mentioned it brilliantly, Ibrahim, um, but maybe what one could add to what you already said is, um, you know, this justification of uh, this time and space of, as being empty, it was also to feel it. You know, you talked about extraction. I, I would also like, like to talk about capitalization. So to um, really create a area that will produce. So it's a productive environment for some people. And that's, I think it really um, relates to the sedentarization of nomadic, of nomadic people and to all the aspects that that you already described. And that's called really regime of emptiness. And it is still colonizing the minds of people, not only, you know, Europeans or, um, you know, people in the West, but also many people in our own zones, in our own areas, in Africa, in Asia, in the Americas. So we do need a lot of people to dismantle this <laughs> concept. <laughs> Okay. Um, so for the last questions, I'll, I'll um, kind of look at, we'll, we'll try to like kind of zoom out a little bit. Um, and so there's one question, and I think it links actually very nicely to um, what Samia just said, but about desertification um, and how it figures into what you think about, but thinking about it globally, right? Um, so if desertification does figure into thinking about deserts in a global way, does it still then represent a site to conquer or spite? I mean, I think site of spirituality, we covered quite a lot. So just thinking about the idea of desertification, thinking about it um, in terms of a global um, framing, 
But then somebody else asks, actually, if you can, if you want to think about a trans environmental framework, um, they're talking about their own work of using thinking about mountains as racialized geographical domains. Um, and they're wondering if you have thought of a trans environmental framework that brings into discussion not only deserts in the ways that you have, but other geographical domains as well. Terrific questions, yeah. So desert education, I think that's a very good, a very good concept to start with. And I think what has been what has been missing, I think, is a conceptual tool that can help us actually to link deserts. So people are working on different deserts, they are doing amazing work. Uh, there are different conversations happening, and we've been so like uh, my colleagues and I, uh, Samia, Jill. Francisco, we've been involved in this like uh, desert, desert Futures Collective for quite a while now. And it's been very nice to be in conversation with colleagues and see what they are doing in other places and like the frameworks that they are deploying. But what really emerges from all this work is that we need to create conceptual tools that connect different deserts. And once we have this connect con conceptual tools and this language that we can use to think about what's happening in deserts, then we can actually think about desert education. So desert education exists, it exists locally, it's practiced as a daily practice. And that's also another important thing, like to think about how indigenous thinking about deserts differs from what they call Saharanism, or even from what we can call desert enthusiasts, because not everyone who loves deserts is a Saharanist or engages in Saharanism, or not everyone who writes about the desert is has this ideology that I, I've been describing, but there are, the, we can also create a category of people who are just desert enthusiasts. They're very enthusiastic about deserts. They love deserts. Uh, somebody in the American West calls them desert fanatics, which is also like another, another term to use. So we just have to kind of like create these categories we don't want to make everybody feel bad for like <laughs> loving deserts or going to enjoy some solitude and all of that. But that can also be linked to projects to transform the way we think about deserts as environmental spaces, as, spice, as spaces that are alive, where life happens, where people exist, where uh, in, in the Amazigh, again, when you think, for example, in the Amazigh conceptualization of deserts, deserts are not empty, not just because there is like rats and locusts and like lizards and snakes and all of that, but they're not empty because there is also spirits that live in the desert. And spirits in the desert, that's another metaphysical existence in the desert that's actually highly environmental when you think about it. Like growing up, we're told, hey, if you do this, if you pour this water here, you're going to burn the spirits and they will catch up with you or they will hurt you. And these are ways in which people are sensitized into thinking about the environment in a really interesting way. But I think the the, the centers, desert study centers can harness their that, it, that exist in different places can harness their resources to actually create tools that put deserts in conversations together, like conferences, seminars, and all of that. But I want to mention one interesting thing that that's been that's been a discovery for me this year: the existence of environmental cases about the desert. So desert spaces where legal cases played out uh, for the protection of the environment. I have a. I write about a case in China, I, write, I wrote about a case in the Sonoran, and they're really fascinating to see how legalese, uh, this ter terminology, and then how the desert becomes a space for legal thinking. And that's again, one of the spaces where this environmental consciousness can, can develop. In terms of trans environmental uh, framework, that's fantastic. And I think I alluded to that in my thinking about islands. Like, it's just interesting because if you say that there is uh, an oil spill in the in the in the Gulf of Mexico, everybody will be upset. But if you tell people, oh, there is a graveyard of of planes right in California in the American West, and there is like a graveyard in Kuwait that has probably I don't I don't I don't want to say a wrong number, but probably over three over three million old tires are just buried in the desert in Kuwait. Nobody cares because. The way we conceptualize life and understand life 
has to be reframed. What's, what, is, what is life? What's living? What's worth being fought for? I think these are quite fundamental questions that we have to contend with in terms of ethics and morals and the definition of life. And then once we define or redefine these tools, we can talk about these trends, um, trans environment, environmental framework, which, which I love. And I think it's really important to put deserts, the same way we can put deserts and water deserts and oceans and this is a trope that comes a lot in literature by the way like when they see sand they say an ocean of sand so let's think about this ocean of sand and the ocean that's the sea and then think about what how we can reframe that and take it to the next level in terms of environmental consciousness so many last words that you want to add I think maybe a reminder that uh, you know deserts comprise one third of the Earth land surface. So, mm -hmm. so it's uh, really that so many territories that are uh, considered to be deserts, and we do need to take care of them because they are ecosystems. And what happens in the desert can affect other places around the world. So what happens in the Sahara can affect what happens in Amazonia. So it's a responsibility. I think it's our responsibility all. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, you know, I have a lot to say and I'm not going to say them, but, you know, I, I will, there are two things that I thought as we were as listening to you. One is that I feel absolutely justified in the fact that whenever the two times that I've been forced to spend the night in the desert, I could not sleep because it did not feel empty to me. It felt like it was <laughs> full of both spirits and animals. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, the part, and the second part is, you know, I mean, it's very rare to, to be exposed to the kind of thinking that both of you have exposed us to that totally changes how you see something that you took for granted every day. And I really feel this is what you have both brought, um, particularly you, Ibrahim, for starting us out on this conversation. I will never look at these images in the same way again. And I'm really excited for both of your work, but Brian, particularly for the second book that you're writing. So, and I hope to bring you all back um, and we would host you again. This has been incredible. Thank you both. Thank you, Brahim. Thank you, Samia. Um, and thank you all for attending our last seminar and hope to see everybody here and more um, in 2023. Thank you so much, Brahim. Thank you. Thank you, Samia. Thank, thank you, you Karen. Sister, thank you all. Thank you very much for your work. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon.